fans, welcome to Unwarranted Music Opinions, a show that is not taking questions about the theme song at this time. I'm June Lindbergh <laughs> okay, here look, with Chad. It has Jenkins. been three episodes, maybe four, that you've brought it up. I like the theme. You guys had your chance to change it, and you fucking missed it. And Brian Courtney. I'm upset now. <laughs> And this, uh, as I've already said, is Unwarranted Music Opinions. I'm not doing this intro again. We go, you know, we're just on the, we're, we're yep. freaking, we just you, go on this. Oh my God, like show. we stuck the landing. Look at that. Holy shit. What on this is show our... we talk about any kind of music, all types of sizes. What's today's episode, June? Today's episode, Chaz, is a sequel <laughs> episode Whoa! in which we talk about artists that we've already discussed on the show whether it was a few weeks ago or like two years ago at this point. And I think that's where we're actually going to be going this time around because the artist I chose to talk about is John Prine. We have talked about his debut and sophomore records on the show, self-titled Diamonds in the Rough. And now we are on to 1973's Sweet Revenge. His junior record, if you will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I wanted to choose mm -hmm. John Prine. I, I, he was definitely in the running mm -hmm. for artists that I wanted to bring back. But given the fact that he passed this year means that, you know, I think me and Brian have both been thinking about his music a lot. We've been spinning his records pretty often. And we kind of just, as a show of respect for the work and just to appreciate him as a songwriter and a human being, uh, just wanted to give another heartfelt, not a shout out because it doesn't feel, you know, poignant enough. Commemoration. A commemoration to John Prine with this record, Sweet Revenge. This album fucking rules. It fucking rules. First off, not as good as Diamonds in the Rough, but so much better than the debut. That's where I'm going to start with this. Really? Yep. I think this album is so much better than the debut. And I know I'm in the minority of that right off the get-go. because I and know his the debut too, though. Mm-hmm. Gave the debut an eight. Sitting at a light eight with that right now. And the Diamonds in the Rough... Nine. That is like one of my favorite albums we ever did for the show, which says a lot. Like it was high on my list and it still would be. I think that album is his best work as far as from what I've heard from him. This album has one thing going for it that none of the other albums do. And that's the songwriting. The songwriting on this album is stellar across the board with some of his catchiest songs to date. Or at least in terms of what we've listened to. <laughs> Obviously, he has so much more music than these yeah. three albums. <laughs> to date. <laughs> <laughs> to date, as of the year of the album's release. Yeah. As of 1973. Yeah. Yeah. This album is kick-ass with so much energy. I think my favorite, when it comes to John Prine, you have two sides. You have the super depressing, super introspective, super heartbreaking, and you've got the punchy, upbeat, fun John Prine as well. This is that. There are no slow, a few kind of sadder songs, but no slow like Diamonds in the Rough level ballads here. It is all upbeat, outlaw, I wouldn't say Nashville country with like some other elements intertwined. This sounds more closer to the debut in terms of instrumentation, but it doesn't really have the it's Nashville. Produced. Yeah, it's way more produced, obviously. Whereas Diamonds in the Rough was not rough. yeah and it was just mostly like a dude and a guitar and just like some like mandolin really like yeah it was very very rough this is obviously more of a studio effort it is more produced sort of similar to his debut which you know had elements of just that early 70s singer songwriter vibe with the organ that would show up or the backing vocals and this album is full of that this additional mm -hmm. layer of instrumentation i mean it's a lot slicker it's a lot smoother mm -hmm. than i think either of his previous records but everything still it's, sounds as you said, really less depressing yeah everything still sounds really everything fun. sounds very very clean what really and, sets and this album apart and, 
I think is the attitude on it. You know? Yes. Mm-hmm. Like, I think that's really what sets it apart is the, the attitude. There's kind of a little bit of a smart aleckness that wasn't present on the first two records, really. There is a it, lot it, of humor. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, mean, I hate humor, you know there are humor. There's humor on the first uh, two records. I hate to. Course, uh, it's it's kind of all over this one. I think it's the difference. I hate to compare John Prine to Weezer again, but uh, if the debut <laughs> was his blue, and Diamonds in the Rough was his Pinkerton, this is his green. Because one of the first opening I track, knew you were gonna say. the opening track, Sweet Revenge, is literally in response to the critics' reception to Diamonds in the Rough. Love. Which Love. still baffles my mind. That yeah, Netflix didn't like that record. When yeah, it came out. it's insane. But what it's a cl- crazy to me! What a clapback! Sweet Revenge is one of my favorite songs from his. That chorus is so punchy, and the female backup vocals add so much to it. It's so catchy. Love the organs on it. Oh, so fucking good. Love the gospel influences on that track as well. From track one to four, flawless absolutely flawless would not have a single complaint about any of those first four tracks you have sweet revenge please don't bury me which is another excellently wonderfully catchy catchy song like i said the songwriting on this album melodic some of his best you've got christmas in prison with another beautiful chorus with some hilariously tongue-in-cheek lyrics and dear abby is amazing as well love the live live cut. cut yeah a hilarious and the reason for that is because they felt that the studio version just didn't have the right punch but with the studio live version and the audience laughing at the humor it really sells the song and him sort of giving the introduction of a song as well kind of transmutes it makes it you know it just kind of elevates it that this is the original version of it you know being live and getting the crowd reaction Mm -hmm. to the humor as opposed to just hearing it on your own I think that was a really smart move that they maybe you know didn't know how smart it would be. The live cuts just sounds really, really good. Right. Crowd adds another level to it. I think this is the catchiest of the three, but it's not the strongest lyrically. And I think that's one of the biggest complaints I have is that while there's some gems, John Prine kind of took a back seat with some of the lyrical content here, whereas his debut and Diamonds in the Rough especially, astoundingly a great lyricist. That's one of the biggest think reasons. About it. Yeah, and I I would agree with that to an extent. I think as far as humorous, upbeat... Tongue-in-cheek, yeah. Sort of tongue-in-cheek John Prine, this is absolutely full of that, and that's super fun. I mean, you look at the album cover, and it's him in a car, like, with some denim jet... It's the best album cover. Yeah, yeah, it's so much swagger. So much swagger. But I agree with you that some of these tracks, not all of them... A few weak but, ones. But for the majority, they kind of lack the underlying darkness that even the happier songs on the debut in Diamonds had. You kind of lose the bitterness that lies under the surface in a lot of his work lyrically. I'm thinking of Sam Stone, which is just a straight up very, very sad and depressing song. Or for example, your flag to Cal won't get you into heaven any- anymore, which mm-hmm. is pretty funny. It's kind of tongue in cheek. It's upbeat. It's catchy. It's possibly the most similar song from his first two records to the tracks on Sweet Revenge. But the underlying meaning and bitterness of whether or not you, you know what I mean? Like the, mm-hmm. the underlying message behind that song there's a lot of the poetic license that kind of takes a backseat to the wittiness, the kind of yeah. playfulness on this record. That's why I would agree with you. Because we've like got songs. Maybe less captivating. Yeah. We've got songs like Blue Umbrella, often is a word I seldom use in Onomatopoeia, which are fine tracks. They're kind of weak in comparison to some of the, the highs on here and compare them to anything off his debut and Diamonds. I just don't think quite muster up. But where they lack in lyrical content, I think they really thrive in instrumentation and songwriting, which is why I love this humor thing. Too. Yeah. Like the humor on it is the selling point as opposed to the thoughtfulness. You not that this album can't be thoughtful because Dear Abby is a very thoughtful song. Yeah. My as favorite is, song. Uh, Gra- the Carpenter. My favorite song on the album, Grandpa Was a Carpenter. Love, love, yeah. love this track. I think it's the best lyrically. There's just so many. It's a bit more stripped back. But it's got a lot of layers to it in the lyrical content. And I just, 
love that chorus. That's what I'm saying is that the choruses on this thing outshine anything off the debut in Diamonds, in my opinion. I just think a lot of them stick more. They have a lot more punch. And I think that is because of the more laid back attitude John has on this record. Then we get The Accidents Things Could Be Worse is my least favorite song. I don't like the line. I don't like the chorus. I don't like the lyrics in that. It feels a little out of touch, a little out of date. What I think that song is about. Do you guys know the line I'm referring to, though, when I say that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What I think this song is about is I think he's making fun of people who are scared to go out into the world because they have all of these ideas, probably backwards ideas Mm -hmm. of what will happen to them out in the big bad world, which is a viewpoint you see a lot in rural areas like where where we grew up. Uh, Me and you, Chaz, like I know people from around where I grew up who have never left the state. Yeah. You know, who've who there are some people who've never left their hometown who are like 20 years old. I guess the point I'm trying old, to older. make is that I think John Prine could have written this better. And saying that alone is kind of disappointing. I would never expect to say something like that from a John Prine album. But I think right. he could yeah, I think a little I wasn't rewrite able to interpret it. I wasn't able to interpret it before we got here to record, but I, you know, I just know it's in good faith. So even if the line was awkward, I had no qualms with it because I know it's coming from a place of I guess artistic license from an artist who's using it well. Right. I, I guess that, just that to me, like it was kind of awkward, especially on first listen. But it's really, honestly, it's John Prine, and I have, you know, it's right. not like he could write a bad song, right? But I don't think he's going to purposely write something racist or out of touch. Or, I guess. I, mean? if I guess the point I'm trying to make is that when I think back at our first time we talked about John Prine and we were all losing our minds over the Sam Stone lyric about the pitcher. And for me to have a moment on this album where my eyebrows kind of raise and not in a good way and kind of a kind of way, if that makes any sense, is just a little like I would never expect that from him. But it's the only time where I just kind of get a little like squinty eyed and just kind of raise my eyebrows a little bit. Like I said, there's just some weak tracks on here. Mexican Home and is just I is just kind of mad to me. That's the thing for me is there's a couple of songs that just sort of like Blue Umbrella and Mexican Home or two. Yeah, I actually love sort of Blue like, Umbrella. I think Blue Umbrella is one of the most emotionally striking songs. I mean, I love the record. lyrical content. I just even though I it's mean I know I said it's kind of weak. Know. It just sort of it just repeats the verse and chorus. It doesn't really go anywhere for me. I think that's I the mean, biggest yeah, problem. Yeah, just instrumentally, there's not. I mean, it's a little more subtle. It's a little more uh, stripped back. But I don't know. It just, it just kind of fails to capture me lyrically or anything like that. You know, it's it's as sweet as any other John Prine song. But I, just I think know he has sweeter. But I know I'm being hard on some of the tracks here, but like I said, where they lack in lyrics, they make up in instrumentation. Across the board, I love the sounds and songwriting that comes out of all these tracks. Well, like lyrically, you're getting stuff that's funnier, you know, like on Sweet yeah. Wind, he's like, uh, you know. I think he just does it better. One of me. I just don't think all of them are hits, is what Often I should mention. the word I seldom use is like kind of a gag title, kind mm-hmm. of a gag title in itself. Right, yeah. And then there's the line on, um, you know, on a on a is uh, got a lot of personality with like, bang with the pistol. Out yeah, that song's you know, awesome. It's, it's a lot yeah. of fun. Then we have A Good Time, which has grown on me a lot. Because at first I just thought that was another weird track, but lyrically that song's pretty strong. That song is pretty strong. I love the sentiment that it's conveying where you have an individual who has just been through so much hardship that trying to find that silver lining is really difficult. I, I, I love the chorus on that song too. Then we get a nice closer, which is I think a cover uh, yeah. nine it's pound a cover rock and roll. Song. Yeah, again, a like little, a little disappointing. Same complaint I had with Bob Dylan. Why are we closing with a cover and not an original? But I think his cover now, of the, the song, the energy of the cover sells it. To it me. Yes, yeah, it like does. The, the way it, does. it goes out, like it's got a ton of energy. Mm-hmm. It's uh, it reminds me of the debut's closer, you know, really closer, which also had a lot of energy, and I and I remember if we really enjoying talking that. about. I'm sure if we talk about his next record, his next record also closes with a closer, but it's a great rendition of uh the song from pulp fiction that you during the twist dance mm, uh, okay it was an old folks wedding you know all that yeah stuff. it's awesome and the old folks wish them well oh it's a great cover of that song. i think it's a great song but i again that's just a nitpick of mine where it's like 
you are one of the most amazing lyricists of all time. Do you really need to do a cover as your closer? Especially when the last two records. But I could see this album just seems like, again, it's another uh, At War With The Mystics and Those Deep Buds. It's just John Prine doing what John Prine does best, but that's about it. However, it's just so good because even a John Prine at his like standard is still stellar to me. This has just solidified my love for him. He's probably one of my favorite country artists. And I'm really glad you brought him to the show, June, since the beginning. I never would have listened to him had it been for the show. And I'm glad you did because I'm not the biggest country fan. I'm super picky about it. I think pop country is just a cesspool. It really is a lot for me to find good country. And so far, you've been killing it with that. Patsy Cline, Dolly Parton, John Prine. Awesome. I really do yeah, love I this album. Yeah, I can't think of one bad country record we've done on the show. Absolutely. Nice, but, yeah. Even the folkier um, cuts, we've had some good hits too. So thankful for that because bad, something about country, it's like a bad comedy. Like bad country is just bad compared to other genres done bad. Does that make sense? I feel like, like when you do country I, I bad, like it's you like. Have like a lot of people like me, like my parents, when they listen to country, they listen to like radio country. And, you mm-hmm. know, and it's, it's bro it's, country, it's garbage. bro like, country, it's garbage. country pop. Oh, it's just you know, awful. Take the take the song and put it in the trash. Not very good. Yeah. But, you know, this is this is kind of even though John Prine is not, you know, one of the original, original, you know, country singer songwriters. He's a super important one. Uh, nonetheless, you know. Yeah. Um, and he's not lyrically really alone. Behind, honestly, he just anyone that came before him. Lyrically alone, he just brings so much to the table. But to see his songwriting improve so much on this record is a treat. Because I think that's what lacked a lot on the other two. As much as I loved Diamonds in the Rough, thinking back on it, I think it was always the lyrics that made me praise him. But I never really talked a lot about the songwriting because it never really stuck to me that much. Here, exact opposite. I think the songwriting across this thing is fantastic. So... To offer my opinion on this and to touch on what you said about Diamonds in the Rough in the first record, I love the songwriting and instrumentation and arrangements on those two records, especially Diamonds in the Rough. Actually, for how stripped back and raw it is, I think that the chord progressions on that one are amazing. They're just beautiful songs. Um, But to talk about this record, Sweet Revenge, I think it's more upbeat it's a little punchier production wise and has a bit more just raucous energy than the previous two, which I think Chaz is possibly why you've connected with this one quite a bit. Because when I think about it, like which John Prine record is Chaz going to like the most? The really funny, very upbeat, very catchy, just kind of straightforward, like catchy, upbeat, well-written songs. Like that's got to have Chaz core written all over it kind of thing. For me personally, John Prine is at his best when it's really focused on the emotion and the poignancy behind his words. I think that is possibly the strongest on Diamonds in the Rough followed not. Yes. Mm-hmm. Followed very, very, very closely behind, if not equaled by his debut. This record, while it is a great record, it's an album I love. It has great songs there isn't a single bad track on here it's a fun record front to back john is a wonderful personality i pretty much love hearing his voice every time that i do but it's not really at the same level as the debut and diamonds in my opinion because i just don't get that same emotional poignancy which is what i really tend to listen to his music for. And as you've said, there, this album is a little bit inconsistent quality-wise in terms of the songwriting. Just like Even the debut. The just like the debut. Yeah. The back half is just not as strong as the front. The front you know has just got some crazy. bangers in it. The more that I think about it, his most consistent record... Is Diamonds in the Rough. Is really Diamonds in the Rough. And it's and astounding that it, that's it's his... more like his most consistent record in terms of style, in Substance. terms of production, in terms of lyrics, and in terms of quality songwriting. Like his most realized like statement 
is probably diamonds. And just like Weezer, the critics hated it. What the fuck? <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> to bring to bring it back to Weezer again. Huh? Yeah. It really is uncanny. I do think that it's uncanny is, how I think that Diamonds in the Rough really is most like realized, fully realized, like flawless release, in mm-hmm. my opinion. Yeah. But I just get caught up talking about Diamonds in the Rough because no one talks about that. But it, I don't want to take away from how great Sweet Revenge is as well. That's just a way of explaining like it's not really quite at the same level. It doesn't hit quite as hard. It's just John Prine Diamonds of a debut for me. doing what John Prine does best. I'm going to give this a decent to strong eight. As much as I have my hiccups about it, the songwriting it just floors it for me where I all my complaints are just nitpicks because I'm having such a great time with the music here. And the lyric content that is strong is really strong that it just keeps me invested. And the back half has a few bangers in it that it's all around just a wonderful experience. Diamonds of Rough is still the best album, in my opinion, and probably will forever be, it just in terms of everything that you said, June. But this is just solidified that John Prine is the GOAT when it comes to country music. And I will gladly always want to talk about him again if it ever comes to that. May he rest in peace. I think each of his releases we've done have some unique quality that make them stand on their own. And even though, you know, I guess I could classify this as like my least favorite of the bunch we've done. I still really enjoyed it because uh, even if John Prine's not, I think lyrically at uh, his full potential, I think he's writing very different types of songs here as compared to the first two albums. So I think he succeeds at being like a witty, funny dude because he is a witty, funny dude. I mean, you know, the album isn't like high concept. It's not as like, it doesn't have a lot of beautiful moments, I guess you could say. But, you know, he, he the great thing about John Prine is he's, he's just so human. And it's it just comes through in everything you hear from him. Uh, even the stuff that just doesn't really match up to his best material. So, you know, I really like this thing. I mean, I would be hard-pressed to find a country album this good, you know, in general, this deep into someone's discography or, you know, as you're digging through more and more albums. Just this level of consistency so far has been really nice. And uh, despite the change-ups in attitude on each record. So, yeah, I'd go with, like, a light eight. You know, it's really, really enjoyable. I mean, if you like John Prine, you, it's, like, can't miss. There's a lot of essential songs of his on here, I feel like, especially with Dear Abby and Please Don't Bury Me. Those two are, like, the highlights because they kind of have all those qualities that uh, all of his other records have, but their own place on this record with their wittiness and their humor and their wit, you know, which has always been there, but it's really at the forefront on these songs. I'm going to give this album like a decent eight. I love it. I love John Prine. It's a fantastic release. For the first time in Unwarranted Music Opinions history, we've all given an album the same rating. Really? That That can't be. That's happened before. That, this is the first time. Really? Let's consult the chart then. Yeah, there's no way. It is. I'm, if I'm wrong, I'll, I'm stunned because I'm pretty sure this is the first time we've all given an album the same rating. Oh, the Wiggles, yummy, yummy. We all rated it a seven. Ah, oh, damn it. <laughs> Shout out to the Wiggles. <laughs> we all gave that. The Wiggles, You yummy, gave that a seven, yummy. June? Yeah. Really? I thought you gave it a six. Yeah. You gave it a seven, June. I know. I gave it a six at the time, but I, it's bumped up to a seven. Oh, no know, like, way. It's it come to a seven? It's come to a seven? Yeah. Oh, sh- that's awesome. So the album I picked is the 1996 release, Richard D. James album by Aphex Twin. Aphex Twin is an artist that I've mentioned several times in the past season. One of my favorite artists of all time. Love, love, love his work. Aphex Twin is a very prominent electronic artist who's known for pioneering several genres in the late 80s, early 90s, including IDM, drill and bass, a lot of his ambient work, ambient techno work, very, very ahead of its time and influential to several other electronic artists that would come down the way. I want to go in more depth of why Aphex Twin is really important to me. We did his second album, Ambient Selected Works Volume 2, last season. Uh, June, you loved it. Brian, you were not as hot on it. You had a lot of uh, issues with it. Not a lot of stuff stuck with you. 
It's because his smooth brain can't handle ambient music. <laughs> and we had Tanner on that show who just did straight up Unga. hated it, which is hilarious. Tanner Brian Unga. His debut is one of my favorite albums of all time. But it didn't just feel right picking an album that's just so well known. And June, you mentioned in that episode that I should listen to this because I mentioned that I had not. I've heard his debut, uh, the second album, and I Care Because You Do, and a little bit of drugs. But I've never listened to this. So I took your advice and listened to it a while back before picking it for the show and was blown away. I think this is better than Ambulance Selected Works Volume 2. So nowhere near as good as the debut. Uh, But they're two very different albums. This has more elements of IDM, which stands for Intelligent Dance Music, which is such which a, pretend- is a terrible, terrible, yeah. <laughs> pretentious name. Ironically, oh, it's, oh, it's, ooh, <laughs> you need oh. to, have, to dance to this, you've got to have an IQ of at least 200. Sorry. Oh, you wouldn't understand. Oh. <laughs> you dance with your brain, too. Uh, oh. And also has drill and bass, two genres pioneered by FX Twin. So fucking Neville Longbottom can only enjoy IDM, you know. <laughs> My family owns. What's just so Neville cool about Stryker. Neville Longbottom? What the fuck are you on about Neville Longbottom? He's, he's a not rich like guy. a nerd. No, he's a nerd. He's not rich. He's not. I mean, he probably has like a fortune left behind by his parents, but he's not like the rich snobby type at all. Draco you Malfoy. Don't know anything? About his Wait, characters. who's Neville Longbottom? Is this he's a, a fucking like a guy who gets picked on because he's has a pet frog toad or oh, whatever. i've not seen harry potter i just know that uh, name is like oh, you so can't make a reference to something that you haven't seen brian that's not how the world works i didn't know i was making the reference <laughs> making a terrible reference it wasn't even work Chaz, cut all this out <laughs> <laughs> anyway what i love so much about apex twin is just how ahead of the curb he was and a lot of his music i just adore i, I just what he does so well is captured the sense of nostalgia. And that is so prevalent on this record for a lot of reasons, as I'll get into later on. But this is released in 1996. Again, just super ahead of the curb, super influential. Two genres that he pioneered that weren't even a thing yet in the late 90s. It is very well received, as a lot of his records are has some things about it that are a little head scratching as we'll get into that I even have some very question, like eyebrow raising moments about it. But what I think this album does well is the emotion that it provokes and the really stunning production on this thing. But I'm curious to see what Brian thought about this, how it compared to his experience with Ambient Selected Words Volume 2 and June, yeah, I know I you've heard this. I this even more. I thought it was terrible. <laughs> I had heard this years ago. Yeah. Because I'm just, you know, top tier music nerd patrician or whatever. What'd you guys think of it? Terrible. No, it wasn't terrible. <laughs> this is an act. It's a fun. It's good. It's good. It's not two and a half hours of not feeling nostalgic like everyone else who listens to the record does. It's very short. Much more my shortest, a little more interesting, a little of more all of his records. This is his shortest uh, of all of his other albums of his discography. It's his shortest record, which is saying yeah, a lot. Like I said, it's um, I like it because it's shorter, it's more instantaneous, it's more interesting right off the bat, as opposed to having to sit with it for such a long period of time and try to find something in it. And it just sucks when you don't, when something's that long. You know, it's like when June has to listen to some Swans record for the show. It's like, right, yeah. she doesn't find anything in it. It's like, okay, you know, that's kind of how I felt about it. Fixed. And it's like, I, I guess I like parts of this, whatever. Really, I'm just being nice because <laughs> I'd never listened to it more than once. I, I don't think if not for the show. But this one was really easy to listen to a couple of times because it was so short. Tracks are a little more interesting. There's some really pretty parts, some really like, I guess, the IDM elements of it where it's like sort of off the wall and a little... I think that's more drill and bass. I think, think so. that's more of a drill and bass aspect. It's a combination yes, of the, the two. The drum programming on this thing, mm-hmm. which is kind of just... So textured and sporadic. Very, very, very. Like you said, yeah. off the wall, left field just goes wild. Some nice electronic strings, too. Obviously, it's all synthetic. It's all made on a Macintosh or some shit. But um, <laughs> really nice strings on the first track, too, that are super duper pretty. 
that uh, honestly remind me of what Radiohead would go on to do. I feel like they borrowed from this a lot when they were on Actually, In Rainbows. Actually, that is a, that is a good point because Radiohead, like Tom York, has cited Apex Twin Kid A. as an Kid yeah, A Kid was a. right around the corner when this dropped because Kid A would come out in like 2000, yeah. 2001. I could see that. I kind of like more what they did with those sounds, but I do love them here too. I think well, they're really pretty. Kid A is a rock record with electronic elements. Yeah, exactly. This is, pure, like, this is a straight up. Record. See, I don't, I don't, you know, to me, my favorite things are like fusions. It's very hard for me when, when, you know, when it's something like this where there's no vocalists and they're sort of, not that it can't be appreciated, but it's just harder for me to get into. Um, just facts, you know, I don't really give a shit how that makes you feel. So the, there are memorable parts of it and there are parts of it that are interesting to listen to, but I don't find myself loving this thing just cause like, I don't find myself all that attached to it. I just find it to be pleasant and detailed music, but I know it's not really anything more than that to me. You know, even I like the last track, how kind of off the wall it is, how it left field it is the pretty much every song on here. I like. I just don't really love anything about them except maybe the first one and uh, The Cure a Weakling Child, which is really That's, strange. I actually think that song's pretty beautiful. Mm-hmm. It's pretty, but it is strange, too. I think four, I think honestly the opening track's the most pretty one to me. Is love that little breakbeat style thing that's going on. Love the strings in the backgrounds. You know, it, it's to me, that's my favorite track off of it. It's just that first one's really great. I love, like, I like how on Cornish Acid and Karn Marth, which those tracks are a little more kind of weird i guess like that's more of the drill and bass elements, elements. To them. some yeah. really they're kind of textural more than they are melodic or rhythm you know there's those elements are there but they're a little more about the sounds being created on there which is an element in like sophie's music that i really like so i was able to i told you i told you in our discussion of her album that a lot of her music sounded just like this told you i don't think it's at all just like this <laughs> i think it has elements of this in it yeah. <laughs> um but honestly, the some of my thoughts on this album, just because I think you all will have a little bit more to say. I think it's pretty cool. I think it's worth hearing. I think everyone should go out of their way to hear it because it's essential and you could probably end up loving it because of, uh, like a billion other people do. But, it, you know, it, it only sort of tickles my fancy, to be honest with you. Dang, I really thought I would hit you with... Th- this I is mean, why it's I good. It's one of those things where like... This is why I wasn't going to pick I, the I mean, debut because if, be pretty good. if you didn't like the second album, you probably wouldn't have liked the debut because the, the debut was a lot of what the second album has just with the beat work but it's super basic techno the only thing is that for the time that was way unheard of i mean it might be good you never know you never know i'll leave it up to you the second one is so bare and so stripped back and so like to me it it almost has no qualities i mean if we memorable or endearing about it to me right if we do apex twin again i might do i care because you do i might do drugs I don't know. I mean, I'll do anything. I, there are very few. I love talking show. about I name on one hand. I love talking I about them. I just wish I could get the album that like floors you, Brian, because I really think there's. I mean, there's a few more. I mean, we can just clear the discography over time. It doesn't matter to me. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I know like one of his albums will hit you know, with you because cool. he is such a lot of the music you love probably wouldn't be around if it wasn't for him. So I'm trying to find the album. I mean, that he, has like, such a, he has such a small discography. We, you know, you should just try to logically make our way through it you know what i mean just right take us through it in whatever order makes sense to you i mean this pick was just for me as it was for you two because i've never heard it and it, it just mm-hmm. completely floored me but uh june what do you think I about mean, this it? one definitely had more moments this yeah one also had more moments for me that were kind of like i can step back and be like hey that's pretty fucking cool but i i, I was never stunned or anything to be honest mm-hmm. i just think a lot of it's really pretty i don't know it's it doesn't have that mind-blowing impact for me like i can't i don't really know I wasn't in the 90s and it's hard for me to put myself in that position to, you know, where this album could, I guess I admire that it could only exist when it was made, right? But, uh, and how unique it is and how groundbreaking it is. But as far as like going back and listening to it, you know, few and far between probably a couple of songs for sure. But I, I just don't see myself revisiting all the time. I'm just glad I did it because I feel like it's essential and I can kind of grow to appreciate that more than I can the, the music on it. So... This album has a vibe that is the exact opposite of the album cover. Mm -hmm. Because you look at the album cover to this thing. So good. And it's Mr. Richard D. James himself just making this terrifying smile at you with these eyes that are sinister. You don't know what his intentions are. But when you listen to the record, 
it's just very sweet. Mm -hmm. It's very childlike almost. It's nostalgic. It sounds kind of innocent. Oh, it's so nostalgic. I agree. I think the way that he is able to translate these feelings of nostalgia, even if you aren't nostalgic for this type of music or this album at all, is something to kind of marvel at, honestly. Because for some reason, even though I never listened to Aphex Twin or any kind of music like this until I was like full on into like music nerddom in high school or whatever, this reminds me of playing Worms Armageddon on the PlayStation 1 when I was like eight years old. Just like the other album, like, yeah. That's what these, I don't know, like why Aphex Twin specifically? That's what, that is Maybe why it's, I love him so much. No artist ever gets that kind of emotion out of me except him. This album is awesome. I love the bead work. While I'm not the biggest fan of IDM, I love just how textured the drums are and just how they're constantly changing. See, and that was an issue for me at first. So I would heard this record years ago. I just hadn't heard it in a long time since we talked about it. So I came back to it uh, and immediately I really dig the synths, I love the tones, the very warm sounds he's able to get with these synths. I love a lot of the very nice, melodic, sweet melodies that the synths and like the bass synth will, will usually be doing something different than like the main melody on the track. It usually makes for a very sweet and endearing and melodic listen. Mm -hmm. But the drumming, the drum programming, which is just all over the place to the point where it sounds like a drill at points, hence drill and bass, kind of put me off. It felt a little bit too sterile to me. It felt a little bit too just performative. Like here is a display of technical prowess with this program. And it didn't really work with me because I found myself wanting to have drumming that would go along with the beat and that would enhance I think that's everything the point, else though. that was going on. I agree with you because this was on listen like one for the show. By the time I got to listen five, and I know that that is a huge music or thing like, well, you just got to listen to it 12 times and you'll like it. But on the next couple of listens, I started to realize that structurally this album is these warm, nostalgic, comfy, sometimes downright cute synth tones that are sunny. And then this very harsh and almost it's not sinister. Harsh, but it's it adds a level of creepy. But I don't think it ever makes the album creepy. It's hard to say. Like it's very much a technical and I think that's explored to its fullest on the closer. Let's talk about the closer. So as June has mentioned, you have a combination of like typical IDM with like the sporadic drumming and fast, you know, drill and bass elements uh, mixed in with these beautiful orchestral techno moments with like these beautiful strings with the beat work. It makes for a really cool sound. And reminds me of Sims. Reminds me of a Sims soundtrack. <laughs> this is like strings, Sim music. Strings. This sounds like Sim music, but like with sporadic drumming behind, it, like sporadic jazz drumming behind it. <laughs> and then we get the closer, Logan Rockwich, which sounds like a cut from Rayman, the video game. It sounds like children's toys, or games. it sounds like a video game like title screen like for a, like a banjo and kazooie kind of game it's odd and intertwined with that are these weird creepy organ chord progression and i think june you just hit the nail on the head i think that idea of childness with some dark undertones kind of mixed in that makes for this weird uh experience is kind of what the closer is this closer kind of with the whole album. Is, yeah. Really. This closer gets a lot of questions of like, why? What? I still to this day do not understand that closer. I kind of am in that boat as well. Like I like closer, it. I don't know if I like it or not. I don't think I ever will. It's just 
part of the album experience. It's just only Aphex Twin could get away with something like this. To me, the childlike, nostalgic, warm instrumentation, like the synth work Grava sang, never comes off as gimmicky except mm-hmm. on the closer. For me, those weird, like, whoop, like slide whistle. Yeah. Type of sound, like a slide whistle. That actually kind of does come off to me as a bit gimmicky and it loses this like personal I would love, connection. I would love to pick his brain when he was making this. It really is one of a kind album. There is nothing that sounds like this. And I think that's for the better and worse of it. I love this thing. I don't think I it's think perfect it's bit, though. I think it has some flaws, even though I really, really enjoy the bass sound of this. I would say that there are definite track highlights. Yes, it's got some major high highs. The first track four, and my favorite song here, To Cure a Weakling Child, which Great. I think- Good favorite, good favorite to have. Out of all the other songs here, this is the longest, or one of the longer tracks on the record, at f- about four minutes long. That would be Girl Boy song as well. I think it's easily one of the more, yeah, I think it's one of the more complex structurally. There's probably the most going on, like by the last 30 seconds of the song where you have, you know, the song fades out and then it comes back in for this final sort of groove. Mm-hmm. That last groove, I think, is the most sort of realized, fully explored moment on this record. There are some songs here that I think end a little too quickly before they can explore all of the ideas that they want to do. Mm-hmm. I think the album at 32 minutes ends a bit quickly before it can explore everything it wants to do. Because by the time the closer, Logan Rockwich, comes on, I'm usually thinking to myself, oh, the album's over already? You know, I, I kind of want more mm-hmm. of this style. And it's um, that is never a thing on any of his other albums. So I'm again, I would have loved to just be with him in the process of making this. Because it's so different than any of the other albums I've heard from him. It really is a standout. And to some love that more, some might like it less. The problem I have with this is that, like you mentioned, June, there are some major highs on this thing and a few weak tracks that just don't quite hit the mark. While I do enjoy Cornish Acid, Peak, Long Ass Number, and Karnmarth, just I like those and I like those when they're in the album, but those aren't tracks I'm gonna pick out on their own. And that's always been a problem I had with Apex Twins, like IDM and Drill and Bass stuff, is that they're cool, really interesting, super ahead of their time. Now what I come to Apex Twin for. I come to Apex Twin for songs like Four, one of his best songs I've ever heard. Love Four to Death. I think we should also shout out Finger Bib as well. Yes, Finger really Bib is track. beautiful. And girl boy Basically songs the ones that are like have the cool little midi sh- or not orchestra midi, the cool you know yeah the, the orchestra cool strings sounding the break beat like the, basically those great little combinations goon gumpas uh, is beautiful too the same thing, you know? yeah those yellow calx is nice too. yellow calx is nice all the weirdest stuff is cool it just doesn't it's more about the textural you know it's not yeah. it's not about the but to talk how about catchy or memorable the song is it's about the sounds and how they fit together to talk about four some more as i mentioned this album invokes a lot of nostalgia out of me and it's not even because I'm nostalgic for Aphex Twin. Aphex Twin's an artist I actually didn't really get a lot into until high school. It's just something about his music. No other artist can do that. No other artist can hit like he can when it comes to nostalgia and memories and childlike innocence. That break, that beat drop in four, where it's just a guy saying, hey, James. And then he turns around and goes, what? And then bam, it comes back in the beat. Something about that almost brings a tear to my eye. It's super emotional. I don't know why. I don't know why that is or why a lot of the songs make me feel that way. That's just what really sells me about this album. I mean, this is a treat. It's not his best work by any means. I still think the debut takes that title, which is a lot because a lot of his other albums are fantastic. And this is a change in sound that I wasn't expecting because I've heard his other work and they're way more akin to his debut and sequel to the debut. Uh, It's just like, I care because you do take some more darker tone, dark ambient with its sound and Drux is just so varied and it's like the pieces I've heard sound nothing alike. So it's a super varied album. This is just its own thing. And I really did enjoy this. 
I'm sad to see that it wasn't so hot with either of you. I think I like this the most. I still really like. I think you do like it the most. I just don't get that level of emotional impact. I do. I don't know why I do. I can never explain to you why. But just when I listen to this album and that first track hits, I'm just a kid again. I don't. I don't know what it is. But this album gets a decent eight for me. I think. It's awesome. It's definitely worth listening to. It's definitely a highlight in his discography to me. It's not perfect though. And it has some major high highs with some tracks that just don't quite reach it. But I think we will talk about Aphex Twin at least one more time down the line, or maybe we will sift through this discography. I don't know where I'd go from here, but I'm glad this went better than the last Aphex Twin album I picked, at least for you, Brian. But, uh, I just love this artist so much. I'm always, it's always a treat for me to talk about him. Decent seven. You know what I'm saying? It's pretty good. For me, I think this album has a lot of great highlights. There are several songs on here that I do love, but while this album is itself very, very good, I don't quite personally love it. I don't have that personal attachment to it. Like I said, I think there's some structural flaws. I think that, some of the arrangements could be more fleshed out, that some of the ideas could be taken a little further. So for that reason, I'm going to go with a strong seven. Not quite as good as Ambient Works Volume 2 or the first volume of Ambient Works either, but it is still, as Ches said, a, a unique record. A very easy listen just to throw on because not only is it short, it's very sweet. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a little bit endearing and nostalgic too. It's not a hard record to really dig into. Now let's take a ride on his tarot plane. My pick for the sequels episode on this edition of Unwarranted Music Opinion. Shut the fuck up and start over. Is Mirror Man by Captain Beefheart and his magic band. While the album was released in... Are you trying to sound like a robot or something right now? 1971. These are actually is, from sessions recorded in 1967. Are you? What is this? This bit? predates the Trout Mask replica. 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 <laughs> <laughs> An error in the system. Somebody should make a version of Trout Mask where it's all wrapped. wrapping. <laughs> Call it Trout Mask replica. <laughs> anyway, yeah, this is get on it, internet. Part Mirror Man, 1971. But all the recordings actually predate. Trout Mask Replica. An uh, album that Brian did not to like. Go on a record. They were, no. Um, it's, yes. What? While extremely creative, it, it is also completely insufferable. <laughs> uh, you know, it's grown on me maybe a little bit, but I've not sat down and listened to it all the way through because why would you? Because it's great. That's why. It is great. But these songs actually predate that album and were meant to go on a record that is commonly referred to as. It comes to you in a brown wrapper or something along the line, the brown wrapper record, something like that. But they were released on uh, this album, Mirror Man. And these are the original recordings that were held on to. It was released under Buddha Records. And I think someone had just kept the master tapes is what had happened. Uh, and they weren't altered, whereas other songs were repurposed later. These were released as recorded, which uh, leads me to a couple of conclusions about this album. It's four tracks long, like four. 50 minutes, I think. 53 minutes. I mean, it's minutes. nothing like Trout Mask. Absolutely no, no, it's, not completely, it's nothing. completely different. I mean, Trout Mask, here's the thing about Trout Mask and Captain Beefheart is Trout Mask is like bigger than Beefheart in a lot of respects. It is an insane record. And not to mention the conditions under which it was recorded have never been replicated for another album and have not produced the same results or even close to. You have strange recording conditions sure for certain albums or strange mindsets or certain living conditions but a lot not a lot of albums are released by a cult leader and his followers more or less you know i mean Beefheart really wore them down on that record and treated them very poorly and starved them it was very manipulative and very dark and a very uh, inhumane way to treat people but on this record i guess that predates all of the horrible shit uh that had to happen for trial mass to happen and what you essentially get here is four tracks, all of which have in common bluesy jams, Beefheart's wild performances, and an array of lyrics that are range from extremely abstract and kind of psychedelic to like impressionist, really, just really bare, uh, less is more sort of thing. 
the phrase repeated over and over with slight variations until it kind of has different meaning. Uh, the jams are long. I mean, these are 19 minute and 15 minute. Not a song here below like eight minutes. It's extremely. I mean, trout that's match. like a standard jam. I wouldn't say it's not like a 30 minute. Jam I mean, they're track. really, really long. Though. I mean, like, just to, like to say these tracks are not long is they're. Long. I mean, they're long. They're not the longest not... jam tracks ever. But we twenty get, minutes is a long. We get track. Swan's it level is. of repetitive jam here. Like, don't deny it. Jim. But it's not even in the same. It's I'm not, not even de- in the look, same. I'm not denying that these are lengthy tracks, but for a jam style of record. To have songs that reach 15 up to, you know, about 20 minutes long isn't uncommon. It's actually not uncommon for like a 60s avant-garde or free jazz record to have songs that near that length. Oh, um, yeah. And especially when you consider that might have been about kind of what Beefheart was listening to at the time. Like bands would sit in, sit in the studios and would jam on stuff for very longer than this and sometimes the final cut that you get on the record is just a portion of that you know and it's so it's just down to what bits they decided to keep and what bits they decided to put on the side i think in the uh, case unless, of this album they kept just about everything for each jam, yeah and, and, what and it feels some of like the shorter anyway. tracks mm-hmm. do have like conclusive endings yeah there's no like song that fades out as far as i can recall mm-hmm. like they all play to the end so it's very raw sessions they now they stumble upon some really great jam and the thing is the magic band is extremely talented between the drumming the bass playing guitar playing and the just amount of detail and the expression you know it's kind of got that the experience jimmy hendrick experience feeling where each instrument is just super killer like everything sounds awesome and is working together extremely well although it's not maybe at that level of the jimmy hendrick experience it's sort of you know, it's just similar well, it's in that each of the instruments style. stand out. Yeah, and also one of the people playing the instruments, uh, namely the oboe player, uh, doesn't know how to play the oboe. And that's Beefheart, who doesn't know how to play the oboe. No, of course not. <laughs> um, which is fine, because it's kind of awesome. <laughs> you know, I always thought like, that it was just, harmonica. It, it, is, it, it comes in at some point. He, he actually, I think, I don't know if he can or can't play harmonica. I can't tell. I think, to me, it sounds like he can because it sounds awesome. Yeah. But I don't know if technically, you know, the ability is there. So but, um, let me say for starters that I think as an album experience, Trial Mask is better. I think the songwriting here, though, is better than Trial Mask. Well, well the thing about the songwriting on hold this on, record is, hold it's, on. is it's just a jam. Like they're they're I running will, over a few different. Motifs. I will get to the they're jam. Not, I, mostly improvised. I will get to the quote unquote jamming of this album in a minute. Don't even start with me. <laughs> oh, I will start with you. When we think of Captain Beefheart and his oh so magic band, what do we come for? I don't come for the music. I come for the wacky fucking lyrical content and absurdism. Humor that Trout Mask I mean, flourishes. Draw. I B part's disagree. a huge draw. This album, I think B part is raw, but he's he is he's not the, the only thing going for cake. it. Yeah, I mean, I the, thing about, the, the thing about the thing about Trout Mask is that yes, the playing is super phenomenally talented. I mean, the drumming is astoundingly good on Trout Mask. It's kind of insane how good the drumming is on that. The playing here is just as stellar. Let's get that out of the way. The playing here is just as stellar. You've got amazingly guttural, bluesy, Louisiana Bayou guitar playing and these just scratchy harmonica riffs from Beefheart, I think. It's very rough and tumble. It's, it's super very, rough and tumble. It's ramshackly. It's barely, it sounds like it's barely it held together, but it's still chugging nothing along. nothing like Trout Mask, as we've said. But I think that's a little disappointing because when I want to come to a, beef our record i want that absurdism i want that just balls to the walls and nuts nutso factor we don't really get that here because the lyrical content I think you do no not as much as trout mask to the point where well, of course not but no album has the, that as much as trout mask the best way i could describe this album is that it's a good album but not a good beef heart album if that oh, makes sense. oh terrible take awful good, no take. 
And the reason I say that is because when you think, look at the lyrical content, there's some weird stuff like take you for a ride on my tarot plain blue cheese face. But there's no skits. There's no weird music. Of course not. It's a jam record. It's not not Trout Mask. I don't want it to be Trout Mask, but when I come to a Beef Heart record, this is not what I expect. Nor one. I mean, there's are there even other Beefheart records with skits on them? I mean, you got to think a lot of those skits too had huge input from Frank Zappa. I mean, Beefheart was more doing the solo vocal performances. A lot of like, you know, for Be- lack of a better term, the bullshit you hear Look, on Trout Mask. I'm not even the biggest Beefheart fan basically. as much as I love Trout Mask. The only other album by Beefheart that I've listened to was Safe as Milk, and that was years ago. I don't even remember what that album sounded like, but I remember that album being quite absurd as well. This was a a head turner. You keep mentioning jams, June. Let me get this out of the way. While these are jams, yes, there's not a lot of jamming going on in my opinion. And this I listened to this is, oh four I listened to this four times. While sometimes a riff might change here and there or a harmonica lick might come in, it is pretty fucking repetitive. And I don't think it's in a good way. I think we have a two- lot of jamming is repetitive. They're riding these grooves and for have me, minor variations. Good jamming is like Grateful Dead or Fish, where each instrument I know, comes like, in. I grew up with those bands too, but that's good is, jamming it's to not me. Not the same style. I mean, I get a bit of a Kraut influence, or I guess this. Well, not an influence. Yeah, because this, came, this out came before. This the came before. The only song that I can see that being true is Candy Corn because of the way the bass and the drums yeah. do the sort of oscillating boom, 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 boom type and of beat. Ca- candy Corn also is like, that one is like the most, it's song. not my favorite. That's I my mean, favorite. It's, awesome. it's one of my favorites. That's my favorite song. It's, um, it's the only one that is like super fucking ahead of the curve. Like it's it's a little post rocking. It's like it is. Huge it genuinely is the building. way that the climax the happens. You mentioned like the, the emotional thing. guitar. Here's it's, my problem. It, it, and it doesn't even really. I don't know if it even means to. You know, I think it's like a total fucking fluke. That I just because the reason is Chaz. The reason is is it's improvisational. They're jamming on these basic ideas and chord progressions. Beef heart. I think most of the lyrics and the vocals on this album are completely improvisational he came up with an idea and he's just figuring it out as as he goes along i think my problem is the same thing is true of the bass the guitar and the drumming the chord changes that occur which they aren't very common they're not nearly as common as like a grateful dead or a fish jam which could go on much longer and have lots of winding passages that sound nothing like the initial song Start, yeah fish would play like i've seen them live like they could do a 25 minute version of a song and get that's like a typically like a very upbeat just like three minute rock tune play most about three minutes and then go off into a spacey like different world this is more about writing these bluesy grooves and chord progressions and just seeing where they go. Right. And a lot of the jamming comes from the minor differences in these small licks that the guitars will be playing, the way that the bass sometimes will take a bit of a a break and, and turn for well, the drums or a beef heart to come in and say something. Yeah. You can definitely tell, I think especially on Mirror Man, that it is improvised because there are several moments where the song almost ends. Mm-hmm. It's like a, you think the song's going to end and then it comes back on and then you think the song's going to end and then some instrument, one of the individuals plays a different kind of riff and everybody else hops on that for a minute before it calms back down so, again and something new comes on. Yeah. That to me, that's a very pretty much a textbook example of a jam right that so how it kind of they're just riding us out to see where it ends and it, see when it comes to its natural conclusion of course it's not windy it's not particularly there's not like a lead guitar soloing like crazy over the whole thing but that's not the style well, of music that this is i don't think right, there's right. ever really been a lot of crazy soloing in captain beefheart or the style of music okay couple things first off more listens did help 
because at first I just could not tell if there was even a lead guitar on here. I thought it was mainly the rhythm guitar taking the center stage, which I still think that's true, but the lead guitar does have his moments on it. This was a perplexing album, which is no surprise because it's b -far. First listen, did not like this thing. Second listen, absolutely adored this thing. Third listen, about in the middle, and then we come to my fourth listen. I think my biggest issue with this thing is that it's too much of a good thing. Like, it's ironic that one of the songs are called Candy Corn, because I think there's just so much of this good groove that I'm just getting, like it becomes kind of, it's super repetitive. And while that's not a bad thing, if it's done well, and I think it's done just fine here, the problem is, as much as I love these grooves, it's just so much of it, because there are minor differences, as you said, June, minor, not major. So if you're not paying attention, it really just sounds like a loop of the same thing over and over and over again. Obviously that's not the case, but to, for me who had multiple listens of this thing, if I'm not paying attention, I really gotta pay attention for those changes. It just feels like I'm keep eating some sweets and I'm just getting a tummy ache from it. Like, I don't think these songs need to be as long as they did because my favorite songs are the nine and eight minute song, Candy Corn and Quaker Man, I believe it's called. 25th century old Quaker. Yes. Candy Corn's my absolute favorite tune. Beautiful melody, beautiful groove. Love, love, love that track. And it's just a song about a candy. And also, beef heart, beef hearts all over it. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. the last half of Candy Corn is those, amazing. Like yeah. Brian mentioned, like almost post rock esque guitar climax. I mean, only retroactively post rock. Right, now. obviously retroactively, but it, it reminds me a bit of like Marquee Moon by Ooh. television. Just mm -hmm. the way it all sounds and Ooh. kind of just comes to this like breathtaking, genuinely emotional moments. It's Candy just... Corn, I think, is one of Beef Heart's best songs in general. Yes, facts. Like I said, I think Mirror Man's better than Candy Corn. The jams, the jams just go on too long for me to the point where. I just start tuning out. I honestly find myself, especially a mirror man, as, as good of a jam that is, the last five minutes, I just like wrap this thing up. I'm done with it. I, I am sick to my stomach. I'm full on it. I don't want to come back to it. See, I don't know if I've been desensitized because I grew up with Fish and the Grateful Dead. But like I but, said, that's not- And, I, and I've been <sighs> listening to a lot of, well, the thing is like, I've been listening to a lot of- Music like this, yeah. Jazz lately. And I've heard a lot of jammy, lengthy songs. So for me, picking up an album like this and seeing 19 minutes, eight minutes, nine and a half minutes, almost 16 minutes for track lengths, that's four songs. I don't really bat an eye at that. Well, that it, doesn't bother that's me not what the way I'm... it kind of did used to. Right. I guess I'm not like, trying to get... I don't ever feel like, oh, God, I want this song to end. Like, I'm just having a good time with these grooves. Well, that's the thing. The experience of listening to this was a trip in and of itself, where just one listen would be great, one listen would be bad. I don't know why that is. I think it's just because I picked up on other things. That's why Candy Corn really grew on me a lot. Like I said, the reason I don't think this is a good Beefheart album is because Beefheart is clearly stripped back on this thing. Because as we mentioned, this is pre-Trout Mask. So it's a lot more tame. It's a lot more of an actual album with song structure and and melodies. But I that's, disagree there. Obviously, it's, Trout Mask has let, some... Let, let, me, let me explain my point of view there. Because Trout Mask, while it is ridiculous, obviously, was very, very rehearsed. All of the guitar melodies and lines, however dissonant and ridiculous they may be, they're still rehearsed, written on paper melodies. Mirror Man, on the other hand, is largely improvisational. I think that the songwriting here is basically just boils down to a couple words that Beefheart used to represent these jams and these chord progressions, maybe a lick or two, a bass line, a guitar riff and then it's not really a, a song writing it's not like a record that you come to for the hooks it's a record that you come to for the atmosphere for the energy and for the instrumentation um i think it's a different thing to appreciate it's a different appeal 
that's you get in maybe like a free jazz record right but obviously is this a, isn't a free jazz record it's not as crazy as that but that you know it's not like an ambient record like a selected ambient works volume two i'm kind of surprised that you find some of the tracks here to be a bit repetitive when selected ambient works is even longer than this ah, record has tracks at about the same length that comes and are down also to very repetitive sonically blues is very hit or miss for me and while I love the bluesiness right, of this, I, I am never, never going to come back to this thing ever. As much as I like it, I just not got to be in a mood for a thing like this. And that's even the thing with Trial Mask. That's just beef heart in general. It's just what am I going to come to when it comes to beef heart? And I'm going to go to the absurdism, ridiculousness, and quotable lyrics every time. Trial Mask all the way. Ambient Selected Works Volume 2, if you remember June, I wasn't the hottest on anyway. That was a strong seven, light eight in terms of like how I usually feel about Aphex Twin. That album was a lot for me as well. You loved it a lot more than I did. I'm sitting at a strong seven for Mirror Man. I think the playing is super amazing. I think the bluesiness is super cool. And I think it's really ahead of its time in some of the elements here. And... It does have a little bit of that beef heart charm, just not as much as I was hoping for. Like I said, I think it's a great album, just not a good beef heart album. And while I get where you're coming from with the grooves, June, to me, again, it just feels like too much of a good thing. I feel like some of the songs should have been just shortened a little bit because I feel like they lose their luster after a while, especially when it's not major differences, minor differences. You've really got to be paying attention. And I just don't want to do that when I feel like I'm, I, I don't feel like I'm getting a reward for doing that. Does that make sense? It just didn't quite hit as hard for me as I wanted it to, but it might grow on me. I don't know. That's always been the case for Beef Heart. It's taken a while for Child Mess to become an eight for me. And I know you guys were surprised by that in our unhinged episode where I gave that rating, but that's just because I've had that album sit with me a long time and listening to it for the show, a lot more things came to me. Listen to this intently, I think I've heard all I need to hear. I just don't think more listens will, like, I don't think anything will really come out to me. And that's what I want from Beefheart, is that I want that replayability, and I just don't think this album has that. But a good record nonetheless. Good album, good grooves. The lyrics left a lot, leave a lot to open to interpretation. You know, Beefheart does his thing. You know, the oboe, we haven't talked about the oboe, which is awesome. It's like <laughs> breaks in like four minutes into the first song and it's like, whoa, whoa, you didn't tell me this album was going to be good. Um, <laughs> but, you know, pretty much like every track here, you know, it's kind of, there's not really a weak moment because it all just sort of flows and flows and it's all really long and winding. A little hypnotic, catchy sometimes, hypnotic other times. Not my favorite thing in the world necessarily, but I, I just thought it was really good. I, I, I thought it was an interesting direction to go because June hadn't heard it. And I thought Safe as Milk was maybe too easy to do next for Beef Heart. I know what you mean, Brian. You know, uh, yeah, I know what you mean. Just wanted to pick something. I hadn't heard it either up to this point. I was just curious about it because Mike Seatown shouted it out, said it was his favorite. So I, I figured it was worth a try. And I don't know. I, was, I mean, I was pretty pleased. Not a lot of complaints. Really good. Just really good blues rock record. I don't know. It's kind of weird. It kind of speaks for itself. Very bluesy, very jammy. It's got that magic band quality where everything is very cobbled together, but still super tight. You know, like the train's about to fall apart, but never does. It's got beef heart. You know, he's screaming. <laughs> it's got an oboe. That's, he's making that scream. He doesn't know how to play it. <laughs> not, not sure what else to say. Just really, really good. Light eight, decent eight, somewhere in there. Wow. Okay. I am going to repeat your score and say like a light to decent eight. As I've talked about, I think that the grooves are fantastic. I think Beef Heart is as just eyebrow raising and oh God, what's going on as ever on this thing with mm. his vocal delivery and lyrics and blue cheese face. I don't know. I still think uh, he's pretty that. tame. I still think he's pretty tame. Trout Mask will forever be just well, the... Well, fuck you, Chaz. You're a, I mean, you're it's tame compared shit. to Trout Mask. Yeah, sure. And I mean, at it's least... It's not as like... At least... I wipe. Thank God this album isn't like Life Without Buildings. Just thank God. Right. God. Oh, <laughs> not memorable. Just straight up not good, really. Don't up with this. 
I love that album so much. You just always bring it up and you're like, oh, it's not good. I know. It must be so hard to be June. It's so hard. <laughs> What's our next episode, June? It's a regular episode. I'll answer for her because she can't do anything right. It's a regular Slided episode. Slide life without buildings. <laughs> and uh, we're just picking whatever, reviewing whatever. Because we've had a very, you know, we did Bish Bosh. We, right, things got heated over Ragdoll. Things got heated over Bish Bosh. There's been a lot of hate. So we're just going to do a regular episode. Just keep it. Everyone be cool. <laughs> you realize that Bish Bosh was like, by the time this episode comes out, was like <laughs> fucking months ago. I mean, I think we've all recovered. You know, <laughs> as far as I go. So we're doing the Shy Girl EP 2018. Oh no, what's it called? Don't tell me. Cool practice. Boom. Just a cool little deconstructed club record. I hate that fucking genre name. Yeah, we're doing that one. Shy Girl, UK artist. Cool wow. practice. It's her only... She has no mixtapes or albums or anything, so this is all we got as far as what I can do for this. Unless you'll let me pick a single. and We'll talk about one song. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. So I am going to do a record that I have been listening to a metric shit ton over this past year, just all the time. Can't get enough of it. Can't get enough of this band. This is a June core pick. We're going to go to Team Dresh, the 90s queer core bands, a little bit of indie rock, a little bit of post hardcore in there, get like a slight bit of grunginess to it sort of angsty 90s sounds, their album, Personal Best. It's time to talk about one of the greatest albums of all time. It's a bit of a meme, but I genuinely love this album and think it is a great piece of music. That will be so much fun to talk about for the show. We are doing the Yellow album, SpongeBob SquarePants debut, (laughs) released in 2005. Essentially, a collection of tracks from seasons one through five. Some great, great gems on this. Ah. Golden age SpongeBob right there. Like I said, it's a bit of a joke, but I genuinely think this album is good and not worth talking about on a themed episode, just a good regular episode. So I'm very excited. I am going to dub this episode, the core albums. We have industrial hip hop from Brian, some queer core from June, and some random catchy shit from me that is only something I would ever pick. Tune in next time for that. Moving on. Oh, wait, never mind. No, it's just the next episode. <laughs> and we'll see you next time on Unwarranted <laughs> Music Opinions. How was that? We got to really work on our intros and outros. Holy shit. They're getting I worse. think all the issues come down to the song, the lead in, the descriptions and the outro and the conversation. I think that's where everything really <laughs> so the whole all show. needs work. It just need, yeah, it all needs work. <laughs> it's all pretty bad, honestly.